Well, welcome to God Talk. This is, I am Pastor Dan Smith, and uh, people call me Pastor Dan everywhere. That's what I'm the most familiar and comfortable with. Not a pastor of a church right now, uh, but I'm still giving Bible studies and preaching, <laughs> doing evangelism around the world. People ask me how retirement's going. I don't have some of the responsibilities of church, but I'm, I'm uh, pastoring where I can, all over and uh, having a good time. Happy to be here at LBN with you. <clears throat> I'm going to try a little different uh, message here today, and we'll see how this resonates with you. My Uncle Maury Venden has a famous parable. We'll just do a very short version of it quickly to get into this message. But uh, he tells a story of being on top of the Empire State Building. And let's say a... Uh, he said, someone comes along and says, uh, you seem to really like the lights of New York. You want me to take you to another city? It's fantastic. It's incredible. Sure. How far was it? 105 trillion miles. <laughs> 105 trillion miles. You got to go. Yeah, it's a, but it's fantastic. It's worth it. You know how to get there? Yeah, I know. I'm the only one really that knows how the way. Do you want to go with me? But another man comes on top of Empire State Building and says to him, I, uh, I got a lot of money. I got, I'm a billionaire. And I'm willing to give you a million dollars with two conditions. At the end of one, you have to spend it all in one year. You can't save it. You can't put it, some of it away. You have to spend it all. And at the end of the year, you have to come back Meet me right here, and you will have to jump off the Empire State Building, and you will die. If you won't jump, I'll push you. You'll have a year of, year, an incredible year, million dollars, do whatever you want, every pleasure you can think of, but then you'll have to die. A lot to think about. City is 105 trillion miles away, million dollars for one year, then die. Gets in the elevator, and there's a man all in black. The other man was in white, now this is black. Black hat, black beard, black suit, black everything. He said, I see you like the bright lights. I got a city for you. How far away is your city? Four hours. Okay, I'll do that. That's better. Jumps on a plane, flies to Las Vegas. He said, I bought a Jaguar. I went all over the city of Las Vegas. I did everything Las Vegas had. I did every show. I did everything there was. I played the machines. But after a month in Las Vegas, it just didn't. I was sick of it all. Maybe I want to go to the other city, the other city of lights. So he said, I went out onto the highway and I began to go. But somehow there didn't seem to be hardly anybody else going my way. Everybody seemed to be coming against me. So uh, I finally... I had to go over to the side. Before, I was trying to go 150 miles an hour. You got to go 105 trillion miles. You better still 150 miles an hour. But now I'm over on the shoulder to get out of all this traffic. Now I'm going 20 miles an hour. How am I going to make it? All of a sudden, the big logging truck, Peterbilt truck covered, filled with logs, comes around the corner, comes over onto the shoulder, hits me. My car goes off the road. I'm all banged up in the car, and I finally kind of wake up. And there's a man at the window, and he said, you want me to drive for you? He said, you know the way? Yes, I've been this way before. You know how to go to the great city? Yes, I know how. But what am I going to do about my car? My car is destroyed. I can fix the car. He somehow fixes up the car and begins to drive. Now we're back on the main road. And we're going 105 miles an hour again. And somehow when he's driving, all the cars and the Peterbilt trucks all seem to go around me. And we don't get hit anybody. And after a while, I watch him. I said, I think I, think I see how to do it now. Okay, if I drive my car, my Jaguar, sure, it gets out of the way. But somehow as I'm driving, <laughs> another car came around. Big Peterbilt truck filled with hay. And I got hit again. 
off to the side of the road, smash down the hill. You want me to drive again? Yes, yes, yes. You drive the car for me. That was terrible. I don't want to get, get hit again. So now we're going down the highway. We're 105 miles an hour. All the trucks and cars are moving. I don't know how he does this, but it's amazing. But I looked off to the side, and here, here is an amusement park. It looked a lot like Disneyland. Boy, I'd like to go to Disneyland. I know he's not going to drive me over to Disneyland, so I said, could I just drive for a minute? I got the car and began to drive off. And right at that moment, another truck came around, loaded with hay, and here was the man in black. I looked and there was a man all in black. Had a pitchfork. You can see where this is going. And I crashed again. And I said to the driver in white, I'm not going to drive anymore. I am done. You drive from here on. We begin to drive on the highway to the great city. And I look back and I could see the amusement park going up in smoke. And I sat back and I said, I am never touching that wheel again. Take me home. This parable my uncle Maury did, Maury Venden, for many years. He had much longer, many more details. The idea that we're on our way to another city, and God has a city for you and me, he invites us to that city, and you have to choose. The road to that city or the road to this city? Which city, which road do you want to go? White and black. But if you want to make it to that city, if you're going to make it, you're going to have to let someone else drive. You're going to have to have a relationship with Jesus. Otherwise, you will keep getting hit by these trucks and these cars. The Bible has a verse where Jesus said, be careful. You gain the whole world, but lose your own soul. Evidently, if you want to go to that city far away, you have to have a soul. You have to have your soul intact. And evidently, there is somebody who was trying to take away your soul, a man in black and suck you away to Las Vegas, to the amusement park. And you have a choice to make. Take this road to go to that heavenly city or go to this big wide road that goes the other way. But if you want to go to that city, you're going to have to have a soul. Don't lose your soul. Someone has a plan for take away the soul from you. How's your soul today? Elijah in the Bible was getting old. And God told him, go touch Elisha on the shoulder and said, that one is going to be your replacement. He goes, Elisha's out with the oxen, taps him on the shoulder and said, God wants you to come with me. Leaves the oxen, oxen has a sacrifice and follows him. To make a long story short, there's a time they're going to go to the River Jordan. He says, uh, you stay here. God is sending me to the River Jordan. No, I'm not leaving you. They go to the River Jordan. The River Jordan is flooded. There's no way across. There's no boat. There's no bridge. There's only one way across because Elijah is a prophet. And there's flooded river. There's no problem. He takes a prophetic coat and he twirls it and he hits the water and the water opens up just like the Red Sea in Jordan. And the two prophets walk across. On the other side, somewhere along the line, Elijah said, you know I'm going to be taken. Yes. What do you want me to give you when I am taken? He said, I am not you. I am not you. You're a big man. I'm going to need a double portion of your Holy Spirit. Okay. If you see me when I am taken, it will come to you. Somewhere along the line, here comes the chariot of angels of fire out of the sky sweeps Elijah away, and as Elijah is taken, the prophetic coat falls to the ground. 
Elisha picks it up and he goes back to the river. There's no electricity that comes with this prophetic coat. There are no signals that come to say, now I have this power by faith. Elijah is now gone. The school of the prophets, young men, are watching to see if the power has jumped from Elijah to Elisha. And so Elisha wants to know too, and he takes that coat, and with all the faith he can muster, he cries, where now is the Lord God of Elijah? And he hits the water. Has the power come? And the power has come. And the water opens up and he goes across. The power has jumped. And that same transition has to happen for every single person. You cannot ride on someone else's soul. You can't ride on the pastor or on the priest or on the pope or on your business or on your family or your parents or your family name or anything else. Your money won't help you. Nothing else will help you. You have to have your own soul. Don't lose your own soul. And you have to hammer out a relationship with God so that when you come to the rivers of life that you cannot cross any other way, you have to have your own relationship with that God. Where now is Lord God? If you're in school, then you're hammering out your relationship. Is the soul that you have right now ready for whatever rivers come, and especially for that final river when we go across to the promised land. Another time, Israel is standing on the banks of the Jordan River. They've already done 40 years. They listened to the 10 spies, wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Now they're back. Same river, still flooded. No way to get across. There's no bridges, no other way. Joshua is the new leader. He comes to them and he said, Moses is gone. Now it's me and you. And God has promised us that promised land. He says, I will give it to you. It's a land of flowing with milk and honey. Yes, there are giants in the land, but don't worry about the giants. I will give you that land. I will fight for you. I will give you every place you set your foot. Wherever the sun shines, that will be where I will give you. But you can't stay there on the banks. So many people are wanting to just stay right where you are. They don't want to go back to slavery. That was no good. And Joshua said, you're not slaves. I didn't make you to be a slave. I made you for the promised land. But they're scared to go in the water to the other side. Are you standing on the banks? <laughs> God says, put your foot in the water. I will open up the water. No, God, you open up the water. You make it clear for me, I'll go across. You give me enough money, I'll give you more money, God. You give me more time, I'll spend more time with you, God. You take all these miserable people in my life out, I'll be nicer to everybody. You first, God. God says, no, you first. You first. Are you standing on the bank somewhere? <laughs> really not wanting to go back, but not wanting to go forward. And God says... I want to take you across to a promised land. And there, you and I, with your soul, I made you with a soul. I did not make you to be at slavery. I made you with a soul so that you and I could be together. I made you in my image so that you could be with me forever with a soul. It is the soul that you are developing with God going to take you across into the promised land. There's so many things that choke out your soul. Satan lives and eats and breathes all day, every day, trying to find a way to choke out your soul, take away your soul. I was a young pastor. Dwight Nelson and I, pastor at Andrews for now 36, 37 years, we were young pastors on the way from Portland, Oregon to Walla Walla to go to a class. We're in the car. I'm driving. We had a little magazine. We were playing this little game in the magazine, and he's watching it, but I'm looking a little bit. I'm in the fast lane. I looked around a curve and looked to me like, boy, maybe that car was on the wrong side. How could you see that? But somehow I said, no, I'm not sure about that car. And I pulled over. And a second or two later, that car went whizzing by 70 miles an hour. We're going 70. He's going 70. We're closing at 140 miles an hour. 
And somehow I saw that that car was on our side of the freeway where two young pastors could have been gone. God, God did that. Or we would have been gone. Two pastors' careers, young pastors gone. We were a family in the Philippines, young. My aunt and uncle were missionaries in the Philippines. They took us to Pak San Han Falls. I've been back since. And back in that day, we got on these two canoes. We're just little kids. Their family and our family, we rowed up the river. People paddling. We got to this place, beautiful Pak San Han Falls, famous falls in the Philippines. We swam and played for a while. Began to rain, began to get ready for a storm. They said, we better get back. The storm's coming. Their canoe, our canoe. I'm just sitting there, just a little kid. And I remember looking up, and here are these canyon walls, and this huge rock boulder broke loose because of the rain and the storm. And that rock, I watched it bounce and bounce and bounce. And all of a sudden, it had a big bounce, and it landed, and we were sure it hit the next boat and wiped them out. They looked back, and they were sure it hit at us. Huge geyser of water. And when the water came down, we were both okay. That rock hit in the 10 feet between the two boats. We'd have been lost. I'm allergic to bees. I've been stung here once in Riverside, once in Thailand. In Thailand, when they stung, it was an hour and a half away from any boat. We were out canoeing, and we stopped on a little beach, and I got stung by this bee or whatever it was, and I felt in my pocket for the bee sting kit, didn't bring it. I was afraid it would get wet, didn't know we were going to go off on a beach. I realized that second I could die. We got back in the boat. We paddled the canoe for half an hour. We're an hour and a half from a hospital. Got back in the little bigger boat, put all the canoes in there. I said, I'm very sick, please. By that time, I was covered with a rash. I've got the reaction. But somehow I was still breathing. We had a doctor. We had a nurse, but no medicine. Didn't bring my medicine. Lay there in the boat, praying to God, keep air coming in, anaphylactic shock. Anyway... Obviously, I'm here. We made it. Had to borrow a car. I no, speak Thai. Can you take me to the hospital? And I made it. We have these physical moments where we just get attacked. I don't know if Satan's behind them all. I can't say that. But in the same way, Satan is coming after us to take our soul. Satan lives and eats and breathes all day, every day to take your soul, to choke out your soul. And Jesus said, don't lose your soul. What good will it do if you take a, get the whole world, but you lose your soul? Where's your soul today? Is your soul going to cross over the river over to the other side? Don't lose your soul. It can be money. That seems to be a big issue for Jesus. Be careful, don't let money crowd out your soul. What good will it be if you have all the money in the world and you got money in the bank and you can buy whatever you want and you lose your soul over it? People all over the world are learning. You can have all this stuff, but it, it doesn't say you were made for God. You were made for eternity. Money isn't going to satisfy you. You're still hungry. Busyness. A lot of us have been too busy. Got to do all this. Got to do this. Got to take care of your family. Got to take care of your house. You got to do your yard. You got to pay your bills. You got to do your job. You got to commute an hour each way. And you got to do all this stuff. And, and you lose your soul. There's no time with God. I teach a class on business ethics. We talk about how to have a balance of life. We talk about the soul. Yes, you have to do your job. Yes, you have to bring value to your company. Yes, you have to. But don't lose your soul. Keep your hold of your soul. What are you doing to preserve your soul? I mean, noise, people playing video games and social media. Whatever you're doing, you got a hair plug in your ear and you're listening to something. Get on the plane. First thing, people are listening to music. Even while they're talking to you, they're listening to music. How are you going to hear God? Jesus says, be still and know that I am God. And you have no place for God to talk and touch your soul. When's the last time you heard something in your soul? When's the last time you heard a prompting from God that you know? Maybe there was no voice, but you know that voice was from God. 
You heard God tell you to do something and you did it and it worked exactly the way it should have worked. And you thank you, God. He spoke to your soul. Is your soul hearing God's voice? When's the last time you read a chapter of the Bible and it just spoke to your soul and filled your soul? When's the last time you turned off the news on the radio or whatever and you listened to music that just stirred your soul? When's the last time you were in a small group with people and you left there and you knew that that your soul was filled with God? When's the last time you went on a mission trip or you got involved in doing something for someone else or you got some food and took it to somebody or you wrote a check to somebody and you know that you did something that was a soul thing that fed your soul. Enemies trying to cheat you, take you away from your promised land. 105 trillion miles. And Jesus says, if you'll let me, let me drive, I'll take you and I'll give you your soul. Keep your soul. And if I can say the last part of this, a big part of having your soul is knowing God and knowing a particular kind of God. Jesus told the story in Matthew 25 about the ten virgins. All ten virgins wanted to go to the wedding party. They're all there on the road ready to go. Five are ready. They have their soul. Five don't. And the five who don't have their soul intact, they come to the door and they knock on the door. We don't know you. There's no soul. John 17, this is life eternal, that you know God and the Son, Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 29, you will seek for me and you will find me if you seek for me with all your heart. Listen to a sermon the other day. This young father, the pastor, went to our Disneyland here close by. And he said they were doing rides, and he just finally, tired of doing the family with rides, he said, let me, let me take my son, and I'll take one, a boy, go here, you take our daughter, you do what you want to do, and we'll do what we want to do, and then we'll meet afterward, do a couple rides that they wanted to do. So he said, I took my son, we went over, we did this ride, it was really fun, we said, okay, got to go back to mom. And they went back, and they found the mother, and something's missing, he said, honey, where's our little girl? I thought she was with you. No, I said she was with you. I would take the boy. You would take the girl. And they were panicked, 70,000 people in Disneyland. He said, okay, I'll go this way. You go this way. We'll meet at the back. He said, I stared. You tried so hard. you looking through every crowd trying to find that little girl. Can I, honey, where are you? I cannot lose you today. And we're both running through the crowd, grabbing his little boy, looking for the little girl. Finally, they got back to where they had left her and they saw two little shoes swinging from the bench. When all of a sudden, a little girl saw them, came running up and said, Daddy, you left me. He said, no, Daddy did not leave you. Mommy left you. But he says, that's what Jesus says. If you'll seek for me with all your heart, you will find me. Find your soul. Find your soul. And can I just say, your soul will be largely connected to your picture of God. If your picture of God is not who God really is, then you will not have find your soul. And you will not have the kind of soul that will cross over the river and take you to the promised land. If you look for a God, if your picture of God is this Old Testament God of fierce and wrath and, and disasters, the God who said... Who, when someone dies and you say, God took somebody. When there's a disaster in the world, God did it. When you're sick, you say, well, I'm trying to learn whatever God is trying to teach me. If all these terrible pictures of God, that will affect your soul. And God says, if you'll seek me how I really am, if you'll seek for me the way I really am, then you will find your soul. Don't lose your soul. Yes, you can lose your soul over money. Yes, you can lose your soul over busyness. 
You can lose your soul over politics in the church. There's a thousand ways Satan has to take away your soul. But the most powerful way is to distort your picture of God so that you see God in a way that's not who he really is. And it'll eat away at this relationship God wants to have. He made you with a soul to be with him the way he really is. And if you go to the wrong picture of God, you will lose your soul because you don't want to be with that kind of God. If I can just encourage you to be diligent about looking for the truth about God. This is God talk. Find your soul and hold on to your soul. Don't lose your soul. Whatever it takes to gain the whole world, but lose your soul. Know the truth about God. Story I've used a thousand times all over the world. Story of the Red Rose. I heard it first from Lonnie Meloshenko, but it's in the, all over the internet. The man is going through New York City on the way to South Sea, at South Sea Islands in the World War II. He's in a bookstore, he buys a used book, he reads the book on the ship, and he likes the notes, and he sees the address and the name of the lady who had the book before, and he writes her in Florida. She writes back. They write about the book. They write about various things. He talks about how afraid he is. She sends him Bible promises. And he feels like they're falling in love. He finally asks, could you send me a picture? No, just let's leave the relationship like it is. <laughs> finally, he makes it. And he comes, the war is over, comes back to New York. He says, I, I just want to meet you. Could you just come to New York? I'll send you a ticket. Come to New York. Okay, I'll come on the train this day. How will I know which one is you? I'll be the one with a red rose. He goes to the train station. Here's train comes in, 1,000 people. And he's looking for the red rose. All of a sudden, he sees it, and his heart sinks. Little old lady. <laughs> How could he have gotten the wrong idea? No wonder she didn't want to send a picture. But he's nice to her. Did you have a nice trip? Can I take your suitcase? You want to go out to dinner? And then she points, and she says, that lady there behind that pillar, she gave me a dollar to give you the rose. God is this God of the red rose. He is only this kind of God. He is God who is good all the time. And if you accept any of Satan's lies about God, then we will lose our soul. We will not have the soul that will cross over because God says, I want you to know me. I'm this kind of God. Get the God of the red rose, the God who is good all the time, the God who is kind, the God who is like Jesus. Don't lose your soul. This is God talk.